nothing sacred here, gentlemen. Always question the people that are, that are teaching you. It makes them better and makes you better at thinking. Because you don't want to hook, line, and sinker just because the guy says it. You've got to follow it. You want to question it. So I started questioning this. But anyway, just to, just to make a long story short, getting to, to Arner Larson, I took several classes from Arner in the early days before Kirk Mothner was around. So this is before Kirk came around. My, my son, Luke, who's now a fireman, he was born in 1986. Well, I was there at Arner's class right after he was born. My wife uh, stayed in the hotel at Invermere, and they, did, they played in the lake. And I took Arner's class in 1986. It, and Arner was pretty big into timber frame high directionals at that time. And, and I took about, well, it, it, in all, when he came to Sedona and we did that world record high line in Sedona off a of teapot rock in 1989, I had taken 10 classes with Arner none of which had Kirk Mothner there at that time. He wasn't on the scene yet. He was still doing forestry or whatever. So in those early years, as I learned more and started to ask questions of, my, of the guy who was teaching me, I was learning this from Arner and had learned it from Butch Faraday, right, at the Grand Canyon. I always questioned Arner on a lot of different things, which anybody here, if you're, if you're worth your salt, you're going to question your instructor. Because it not only does a couple things, it makes your instructor have to work for what he's telling you, right? He has to research it and make sure he's giving you the correct information. But it also makes you better as a critical thinker. You want to be critical. And he, what, what Tom just said is that we've always done it that way, so why change it? Well, I, that's not good enough for me. So I started to argue with Arner Larson early on in his classes. If you ask him or ask Rick Lipke from Conterra, Rick was there in the very first class. In fact, when I was sitting in Arner's basement, I was one of the last guys to get there. I was sitting in his basement. You could see the wiring and the plumbing above your head, you know, and the rafters and everything in, in his little teeny basement. And here comes Rick Lipke opening the door right into my, the side of my head, you know, and, and you know, I was sitting right by the door, and he goes, boom, and almost knocks me out, you know. And that's how I met Rick Lipke. But, but we used to argue with Arner. And I'll tell you right now, the guy is a super smart guy, and 95% of the arguments, I lost. I got pretty badly bloodied in arguments with Arner Larson. But there were a couple of things that I had him on. And one of them was this, what we're doing here today. I always asked Arner, he says, the BCCTR... Belay competency drop test indicates a one meter drop onto three meters of rope. That's the worst case scenario. And I always said to Arner, I said, Arner, that's not true. I said, we're going to end up with a two meter drop onto three meters of rope. And we argued back and forth about this. It's not going to happen. I said, yes, it is, because you, you have that high directional, like I have it drawn over there. You have that high directional up to two meters minimum, and some fire departments even put it higher so that's above your head, you're looking at a two to two and a half meter fall off that edge down onto the, what would be worst case scenario would be a three meter chunk of rope before it went to the tandem pressing belay. Well, what, what's that fall factor? Just right there, it's 0.66, isn't it? Because the length of the fall divided by the rope and service, well, that's 0.66. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even uglier, as you're going to see in what I'm going about to show you, is you're, going to, you're also going to fall over the edge. So you're going to fall like three meters onto three meters of rope. And so this argument between Arner Larson and me went on and on, producing tremendous heat and very little light. Right? We went back and forth on this. I thought I had him. And I came back. And I chewed on that, and I said, well, and the other thing I argued with him on was also that in a steep high line, I said, you're on a single point. Anytime you do a steep high line with the Kootenai high line system. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, because you're using that upper tag line as the main line. It's lowering the guy down a sloping or a steep high line. I said, that's a single point. You're always preaching two points. How do you get away with that? So that was, again, the student questioning the instructor. You guys need to do the same thing. Nope, nothing sacred here, gentlemen. 
always question the people that are, that are teaching you. It makes them better and makes you better at thinking. Because you don't want it hook, line, and sinker just because the guy says it. You've got to follow it. You want to question it. So I started questioning this with Arner, and I said, well, okay, there's a couple things here, but let's just go to this AHD problem. I said, all right, look, look at the potential fall we're going to take if the set of fours is not included in there. You see the set of fours in Tom's drawing? I, I insisted that he put that there because this is, without that there, look at the fall he's going to take. And I'm going to show you in some video that we did in 2005. We finally got around to testing it in 2005. I think the alternative to including it into the high directional is unacceptable because if you're leaning back like this gentleman here, I don't know who that is, but if you've got that litter and you've got somebody in the litter and your feet are firmly planted against the lip of the cliff and then something happens and we all know, I think everybody here and I think that we confirmed this even yesterday with a little slight mishap that happened, most accidents happen at the edge because of a miscommunication Somebody's loaded the brake rack upside down, doesn't catch it. Uh, some issue where the guy thinks you're ready and he's tunneled down. You know how people tunnel down when they're at the edge, they're a little nervous? They tunnel down. You know, there could be an open carabiner one foot from their face and they wouldn't see it because they've tunneled down and they, they're thinking about their little environment, which is about ready to go over this edge, and they lean back before the guy's ready. Does that ever happen? I ca I've caught guys in my classes doing that. They, they, they're nervous. They don't like it. They're, they're out of their element. And they start to lean back. And I grabbed one guy by the shirt one time. I said, where are you going? He says, I'm leaning back. I said, no, he hasn't even loaded the brake rack yet, you know, under the high directional. There's all kinds of things that happen at the edge. So my, my, in, my, my biggest fear is that we are going to careen, something's going to happen at the edge where the belay is not temporarily included in the high directional for the edge transition, whether it's raising or whether it's lowering. Now take your chances. What, what would you, let me ask you a question. People say, well, you can't clip it to the high directional because of this reason. It's a critical point. And I, I have to acquiesce to that. I say, all right, you're right. It is a critical point. It is a critical point. And they go, see, gotcha. Because you preach, you bow daily before the altar of the critical point test every single day, don't you, Reed? And I go, yes, I do. I say, yeah, everything. I bow before that daily. All right? All right? So let's take it out of there. What's the alternative? a three meter fall onto three meters of rope, and you are definitely going to the hospital. Your kneecaps will never be the same because the litter is gonna do what? Your feet are against the edge, the litter's on your lap, it's gonna run you over and bend your legs backwards. You'll never be the same again. I said, okay, so that's, that's the alternative to including temporarily the belay into the high directional to mitigate that issue. Sure, the, the high directional could fall over, but I'll take my chances with that. I'd rather do that than take my chances with this, without, that, without the belay. So I'm going to show you what happened in 2005, right? And you guys make your own decision. I'm not here to tell you to do it one way. I'm just telling you, think about it. Because I think Arner was wrong. I think I had him over a barrel on this one. And again, I, I'm, not, I'm not bragging, guys, because that guy beat me up. Every battle I ever did with Arner Larson, I left badly bloody. The guy was an, he was a, he was an intellect and a mind that, that can't be beat, just like John Dill from Yosemite. The, both those guys I had the privilege of working on with those drop tests in Sedona in 1989, the belay competency drop tests. And I was the, I was the green kid, you know, running around helping them. And I learned a tremendous amount from working under individuals like that. So I just want you to be that way. I want you guys to be critical thinkers. And I want you to leave here not saying anything sacred. No, it's not my way or the highway. I want you guys to think and question your instruction and make yourselves better. I know there's a lot of instructors in here. You need to do that. So that's kind of a preface to where this all came from. It started in 1986.